You're about to join Jerry Parker, Maritz Siebert, and Niels Kostrup Larsen on their raw and honest journey into the world of systematic investing and learn about the most dependable and consistent yet often overlooked investment strategy. Welcome to the Systematic Investor Podcast Series. Jerry Parker, Moritz Siebert, and I, Niels Kostrup Larsen, are back with this week's edition of the Systematic Investor Series where we share our experiences, the ups and the downs of what it's like to be a rules-based investor, and of course, where we also take uh, some of your questions. And uh, since we're all in New York this morning, let me start by saying good morning to you, Jerry, and good morning to you, Moritz. How are you guys doing? Good morning, Niels. Good morning, Jerry. Good morning. Doing well. Great. I mean, we just wrapped up two very um, focused days with a great group of people. Uh, discussing all things trend following, I think it's fair to say. Um, and based on the feedback we've received so far, I think it uh, went very well. Uh, and I'm pretty sure that we're going to see some breakthroughs um, from most, if not all of them, in terms of really accelerating their uh, trend following journey. But what was some? I'm just curious to hear some of your some of your takeaways uh, from from this weekend's uh, live event. I loved it. I think it was great. Um, enjoyed the people. Enjoyed, you know, uh, with you, Niels and Jerry, just a, a great weekend speaking about trend following all the time. Um, I had the feeling that people really wanted to learn more about it. Some of them were a bit farther along in their journey uh, with trading. Others were, you know, trying to make a start or they had already made a start. But the questions we got, I thought they were they were all good. And I hope that we could make... Um, you know, provide some added value to them to help them along with, you know, good trading. Yeah. Yeah. I mean, I agree. I think uh, we had a couple good long sessions and we're able to, I think, get to everybody's questions or most of them. And then uh, there was a lot of good conversation at lunch and dinner, drinking some nice wines together and becoming friends. And I guess especially yesterday, people were talking about how just having people to talk to and knowing other people that they can share their thoughts with and their problems and their drawdowns with. So I think we may have created some uh, long-term friends that we'll see again. Yeah, no, certainly I I, uh, I concur with with all of that. And uh, uh, you know, these when when coming to live events, I'm sure you feel the same from from other events you've been to. I mean, it's not just about the days you spend there it's about the relationships that's uh, that's created and and how it uh, moves on from there one of the things that i took away from the conversations uh, and this weekend is actually when when you um, how much the mental side the, the 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 challenge with trend following from from the mental perspective uh, really uh, matters uh, to um, to pretty much all of the people coming so i thought it was very timely and useful that we had uh, Denise uh, Scholl, um, performance coach, to come and talk about um, ways that you can, um, you know, not only identify uh, some of the signs, and uh, but also some practical exercises about how you can deal with that and trying to find out, you know, deep down what really is behind some of uh, the struggles we all face uh, uh, in, in our trend-following journey. I thought that was really really special as well. Yeah, I thought Denise was a, uh, a big addition to the group, and I think other people thought the same. Uh, and uh, <clears throat> just because you're trading systematic or trend following doesn't mean you don't need some coaching, and some understanding of what's driving some of these emotions. Uh, I thought her big insight, one of the big insights for the weekend for me was her thoughts about uh, how clients didn't fully enjoy uh, being told about strategies that have outlier trades and uh, they prefer sort of a normal calm distribution uh so that was kind of enlightening to me exactly i mean i actually think that was really interesting to hear how when we we as trend followers love to show the the fat tail chart and actually what we might might be doing is ourselves a big disservice because visually when people see that they might think oh that looks more, much more risky than that I really want. Uh, so yeah, that was a great insight, actually. They get scared. Yeah. And one of the things that I found interesting, and I'm still thinking about it is the emotional side of, of, of our trading, like, you know, with our rules and our systematic approach, 
we're trying to get rid of the emotion and just, you know, automate our trading and systematize it and, um, and not care about the emotional side too much. But she was saying, you have to take in your emotions and really confront them and, uh, and deal with it. So I'm still thinking about this as, you know, probably on the flight back later on tonight, I'll continue thinking about this. What, what is, what is the best way to go about this? Is it to deal with your emotions and take every single one in, or is it to try to, you know, keep them away from you? Yeah, leaning into the emotional challenges, I think, was the way she phrased it. I think that exactly. was uh, pretty cool as well. So I think, I mean, interestingly enough, um, you know, we all learned something. We all took away something from the weekend. Uh, and uh, and uh, you never know. We, we may do it again. So uh, watch this space. Anyways, back to kind of normal programming, I guess. Um, I was on holiday last week traveling around uh, over here in New York, Washington. So I have to say my, um, you know, what caught my eye uh, the last week or so, um, you know, probably not so much. Um, of course, uh, it was interesting from a European point of view, in a sense, that uh, it was the last policy meeting of uh, Mario Draghi after eight years, eight cuts, zero hikes leaving European interest rates as minus 0.5%. That was his um, contribution, I guess, to European monetary policy. That's his legacy. Uh, and now we have a new um, you know, lady at the helm of, of the ECB, and we'll see what uh, Christine Lagarde can do. Um, you know, Maybe she doesn't, with the last CPI figures from Europe, maybe she doesn't need to worry about hiking anything other than the hills around Frankfurt for the next few years. Uh, who knows? Um, but, um, uh, one thing though, that being over here and sort of reading newspapers in the morning, uh, you know, over a cup of coffee, it, it was hard not to notice this whole story about WeWork. And I know this is far, far away from trend following. Um, but actually when you read the story and how something like that can completely collapse, um, I think from a valuation of something like 45, 48 billion down to, you know, a fraction of that. Um, we know a lot of investor appetite was there a few months ago. We know how people love these stories and these, uh, you know, very ca charismatic people. Um, but I think it's a good reminder because this is so far away from trend following that you can come, uh, you know, no transparency, no liquidity, um, you know, no track record. I mean, the guy had failed with a business selling high heels and baby clothes beforehand. So, I, you know, sometimes I just hope that investors, uh, you know, remind themselves that it might be a good idea to look at these tried and tested and transparent and liquid strategies and, and embrace them rather than, you know, calling it a black box or whatever nicknames we've been uh, given over the years. So, so that was kind of my um, my sh small takeaway from spending ten days in in the U.S. Uh, reading the financial uh, press. So let's um, turn our attention well, to you. Yeah, go ahead. Just to comment on that. I think uh, I'm I'm all always looking forward to adding uh, different markets to the portfolio to increase diversification. Hopefully, so. Uh, but my process would be something like, okay, I'm excited about Beyond Meat or Uber uh, and things like that, but I'm going to wait for um, a better year's worth of data and then make sure it's liquid, uh, get in get in touch, get in line with the trend, maybe take a small loss. And uh, so it's okay to introduce WeWork. It's okay to trade Enron uh, as long as you just follow the trend and make a lot on the upside, make, maybe make a lot on the downside when it fails and goes out of business. So it's good to have a methodology to a careful process uh, when you see new things happen. And uh, that's what we sort of offer for our clients. Yeah. And, and I, of course, I wasn't looking at it from a trading point of view. I was just looking at it from a business point of view that, that people love these stories. Um, you know, uh, but you're right. I mean, the thing is, and that's the beauty of what we do, that and actually, frankly, we don't know or we, and we don't really worry about whether it becomes a success or not. As long as it's liquid, liquid, we can trade it, we can test it. Um, absolutely. 
So anyways, March, I know you've also been a little bit on the road uh, in the latter part of last week, but um, usually when you go away, you have a good week uh, from your trading program. So how how did that all pan out? <laughs> I wish this is the outlier week. Um, it didn't have a good week, but it also didn't have a bad week. It's kind of like flattish. Um, I looked at the numbers just now before we did the uh, started the recording. Um, 30 basis points up. Um Really not that much movement in my portfolio, to be honest. Bonds back and forth, um, still very large position in the bonds, as I've mentioned before, but didn't make a lot of money from them. Um, I had the feeling or what I saw is that, you know, some of the volatility that has been building up uh, prior to the Brexit uncertainty has now subsided and uh, uh, markets have kind of like, you know, corrected a bit around the, the Brexit event, which now seems to be delayed until I don't know when, January next year, who knows? And um, so I don't know, um, made a bit of money from the emissions contract, which moved a bit higher. Um, gold, I think, made made a, a leg higher just a bit, which made me money. Um, but really not that much going on in the portfolio to really be too excited about. Sure, sure. It was an okay week for us, actually, on our side. Um, some of the things um, that, uh, that we're in started to uh, move uh, a little bit back in our... In our favor, so to speak, um, you know, certainly uh, some of the uh, I mean, the equity markets were pretty strong on our side. Uh, we did fine on that. Uh, currencies um, were fine. Weaker currencies against the dollar, generally speaking. So that worked out well. Um, and, um, you know, U.S. fixed income, um, not so good uh, this week. Um, but U.K. fixed on income actually uh, did fine. Um, but biggest, basic, big, biggest losing market for us uh, for the week was coffee. Uh, we are seeing definitely a bit of a re reversal on that side. Grains did okay. Um, metals did fine. Gold in the lead in that sector. So, uh, yeah, all in all, I mean, we're seeing some more appetite for risk in, in the portfolio, especially in equity. So as the markets are moving back towards um, you know, new highs, possibly, who knows? Um, so that's showing up as a bit more trendy behavior for us. So we've added a bit more risk in that sector. Um, but yeah, so all in all, um, you know, still down for the month, but at least we had a good week. I agree with all of that. Palladium, I think made new highs as well. Um, cattle making highs, my short positions, not looking that great. But uh, Bitcoin, don't forget about that over the weekend. A lot of buzz Oh yeah, about the Bitcoin rally. I was just wondering, I don't think I remember or I've ever known uh, about your trend indicator. Ah. Niels, are you able to explain the philo philosophically how that you're trying to look at the trend environment? So we um, developed this many, many years ago. Not, not, not just me, but the, the people I was working with at the time. And uh, so I don't actually recall exactly what we put into it, uh, so to speak. I mean, it, it's a number of, I think it's... I think it's like 20-ish um, momentum indicators, some of them very classical momentum indicators, just trying to identify whether a market uh, is moving or not. And the way, so it's it's called the the, the, the trend barometer and it's uh, daily updated on, on uh, the top traders' website. And it's trying to describe uh, as accurately as you can whether a market is is identified in, 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 in an uptrend or a downtrend or kind of in a new stock in a neutral range. And it's 44 different markets. And when you look, you can look at them individually, the markets, but you can also look at it as, as an index, which is what I tend to do. And what I found is that at the end of each month, um, if the trend barometer finishes, let's call it between 40 and 50, it's kind of a flip of a coin, whether the CTAs or trend followers were up or down for the month. However, if you start getting down to the numbers of, say, you know, 25, below 25 for sure, but I mean 25 to even to 35 as, as the month end reading, you should expect a down month for the trend following uh, group. And if you're kind of above 50, uh, up towards, um, you know, 65, 60, maybe even 70 is kind of the highest numbers I, I've noticed at the end of a month then you should expect a positive month uh, for the um, uh, trending group. And what's interesting about it, this was something that was developed back in around when CTA performance or trend-following performance started to 
um, let's say, take a breather, um, so back in 2009, thereabouts, and there were a lot of people who could not explain why trend following wasn't working as well as they were hoping for or expected. Um, so a lot of large firms, you know, multi-billion dollar CTAs came to us at the time and asked if they could use the data to help explain uh, these things. So I think it's a pretty, um, you know, if you just want to have an idea of, of the environment for trend following, I think it's not a bad indicator. It's 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 not. Um, it's never going to be a hundred percent, but it, I think it's a good guide uh, to the environment. And and when you look back at it, um, you'll definitely see that it's been struggling for a while um, in terms of consistently high readings, um, and that kind of ties in with um, you know some of the years we've seen recently where where overall CTA indices haven't done so well. Even though I don't want to talk performance down because I actually think it's just normal that you have these uh, periods of time. Um, but it certainly ties in with, with what we've seen uh, performance-wise and what the barometer has done. So um, I think quite a few uh, people uh, follow it and I, I keep an eye on it as well. Um, and uh, if it's useful for people, then great. It helps just to take the mystery out maybe of, um, um, you know, uh, whether whether it should be kind of a good environment or a bad environment for, for what we do. Is Bitcoin part of that? No, no. <laughs> shame. Shame, shame <laughs> on me. Um, you never know. One day, maybe. Who knows? So um, I know you mentioned, Jerry, that uh, it was a little bit of a maybe a slow week on Twitter, but hopefully there's still some few golden nuggets we can dig out, discuss uh, some, some uh, topics. Yes, of course. I missed this a few weeks ago. Uh, it was a quote, uh, tweet from Wayne, I believe. And uh, I don't think this topic came up directly at our uh, weekend together, but I think it's a good one to remember. Wayne says, judge a trade not by whether you made money or lost money, but whether it was the right choice, not judging by what happened, but by the decision. This is formerly known as outcome bias. Most people would have a tough time judging a loss as beautiful. So uh, I've said you're supposed to love your losses, and then Wayne says your losses are beautiful. So I uh, thought that was interesting. And it's exactly what we do, you know. Um, we implement this system, and we say to ourselves, judge me if I, if I implement my system. I'm always trying to improve it and make it better and tinker. Not too much, but um, really... I'll give myself an A-plus if I just remain disciplined and do the system the way it's supposed to be done. He goes on to say, you lost, but when the odds were in your favor, you did the absolute right thing. You should and would do the exact same thing every single time you're in that same position. Even if you lost five in a row, the outcome does not alter the decision. I mean, I learned, I learned this in 1983, so, and I haven't always done it, but I have always believed it. And uh, it's funny that Wayne's not even a trend follower, but uh, this is what I find on Twitter. We have lots of friends who have similar beliefs, even though they do things slightly or much different than we do them. It's certainly, certainly one of the, 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 the key takeaways I always think about when I think about some of the conversations we've had in the past, uh, Jerry, is it's just how, how, you know, how you were all taught to... Uh, to and and celebrate it for following the rules, uh, you know, even if it was, uh, you know, uh, going through a losing period. I um, it reminds me of what Annie Duke uh, in her book Thinking in Bets, I think it's called, uh, talk about that you can, you know, if you go if you go over a green light but you have an accident, doesn't mean you did a, made a bad decision, right? But you can go over a red light and get you know get over without a problem, doesn't mean you made a good decision. But we just make we just make, we for us it's not about good or bad it's about just following the rules and 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 not judge them whether I mean we know already that sixty percent of our quote unquote signals and decisions are going to be bad decisions because that's just how trend following works so uh, we shouldn't get too too upset about it. Process over outcome is so important. Don't think too much about the single trade. It's just one trade of so many. You're doing the right thing if you're following the system. Just put the trade on if it's a losing trade. You know, get on with life. Uh, ideally, love that losing trade and just do the next one. Yeah, yeah. I mean, as hard as, as it can be for most people. We always feel a lot of outside pressure to 
and criticism for giving back too much profit or not handling, not making as much as other people on certain trades. Uh, somebody this weekend said, oh, Niels said uh, you had, had done would address issues with clients about uh, the two things you felt were the weakness of trend following uh, choppy trendless periods and the give backs. So uh, you want to address those things. You want to address them in a good way that is going to be profitable in the future. Uh, but still, you're going to have some of them sometimes, and um, it's not going to be fun. But, you know, any individual, tr any trade at the moment is just total random what's going to happen. No one really knows. So you win in the long run. Yeah, and, and the study that you brought up, uh, and I think you brought it up on the podcast as well, where they found that a lot of the most successful traders uh, out there over a long period of time, they also had some of the longest underperformance periods uh, along the way. So, uh, uh, yeah, I mean, you, you you just can't remove all the bad stuff and, and only be left with uh, with all the performance and, and the straight line on, unless you are Bernie Madoff uh, or some someone like that. That's just reality. That's right. Mm. What else is in the goodie bag from Twitter? <laughs> Well, my top two, of course, is uh, Wayne and Morgan Housel. Um, he always says something good, especially on Fridays. Um, and this was, I think, last Friday. Um, and I like this. And you know, so many of the things I like doesn't get a lot of attention on Twitter. But I like this one. I've tried to say this many times. It sounds contradictory. And I'm not a, very good at explaining what I think about this. But uh, I'll try again. He says, history never repeats itself. Man always does. You can learn from history, but understanding that things change is not an ignorance of history. It's probably one of the greatest, one of history's greatest lessons. So CTAs do backtest and dis decide uh, the systems and the parameters to trade with these mechanical rules, uh, moving averages and breakouts and things like that and getting gear with the trend and... A lot of this is going to be heavily influenced by the what's worked in the past, to say the least. And yet, uh, history is going to be different in the future. Uh, we've made money, or uh, well, the systems have done well historically. Different time, different age, different fundamentals. And now we fast forward to zero interest rates and Trump and uh, QE and things like that. And it's going to be the same in the future. So, But we expect these parameters and these rules to continue to work. Yeah, it, it also reminds me of uh, when, when, when we as a group um, get criticized for having made so much money in fixed income for the last uh, many, many years. And people kind of make the conclusion that therefore, with interest rates where they are and, and possibly starting to go up at some point, that therefore we as a group can't make as much money as we did in the past, but that's just complete false logic. Uh, I mean, the, the past or the future will never be as the past. Um, we will have, have conviction trades, so to speak, in, in other sectors, in other markets, and they're the ones that are going to be providing the returns for us. Um, because as you say, I mean, humans don't change, and um, the way we interpret uh, interpret information, the speed we interpret information, the decisions we make, creates these imbalances that leads to trends from time to time, sometimes more than, than others, sometimes longer than others. Um, but uh, And I think it's classic, actually, that at least uh, for, for, for a long period of time in 2019, trend followers was enjoying some of their best returns, um, even though um, people are so quick to uh, conclude that, that that should not be possible given all the everything that's going on, whether it's the speed of tweets from Trump or whether it's, you know, uh, interest rate levels, uh, whatever it might be. Um, so we'll just continue to prove them wrong. There's absolutely no reason to criticize us for having made money or still making money maybe from the bond markets. That's the market that has been trending. It's such a nice trend. That's exactly where you want us to be. That's exactly where you expect us to be. Appropriately sized Riding the trend, making money from the bonds, that's what we do. No reason to criticize that. That's the trade that you need to have on. I mean, could you imagine if we weren't doing that in the bonds? You know, they'd say, what are you doing? What are you waiting for? I mean, and, and as I've said many times, usually it's, it's something like that's goofy and that uh, 
<clears throat> most people, because they're looking at fundamentals or common sense, well, can't buy these bonds. The rates are so low. There's no opportunity there. And so that's uh, why a mechanical rules-based system that pays attention to the price trends only is so good to be added to a portfolio, not just uh, the diversification, because everyone has bonds or stocks necessarily, but and uh, the trend following in the small losses and the trailing stops that get you out when the trend reverses is good too, but just the pure fact that you're looking at the, uh, the price only. Uh, we had that question this week. What else should we look at? You know, so nothing. That's enough. It's all right there. Yeah, true, and uh, and uh, you know we see that with uh, with markets from time to time. I mean, some people are nervous about equities, right? But we're still long equities, and will continue to be long as long as they make new highs or close to new highs, etc., cetera, etc. Cetera. And uh, and it's the diversification of process. I mean, I think we talk a lot about uh, often diversification as something that is just diversification of markets and return streams, but actually diversification of process what we add to a portfolio of maybe um, discretionary managers, if you're a big uh, pension fund and you have other types of uh, investment strategies or making your own decision on that, I mean, that's valuable as well. It's not just the diversification of markets we add, uh, even though that is important, but just the uh, the process we go through to get our trades on is, um, is, is super important. Sometimes there's a big trend following fail, when the stocks go down and we're getting out and we sell the downside breakout in the S&P and it goes right back up. So even something adding, uh, uh, you know, even even though I don't like uh, the passive holding of stocks, the 8% return with the at least 50% historical drawdown, you know, you could put a small piece in there and it's probably do pretty well when the trend following doesn't do well. Uh, so... Everything can fit in there and have, have a place, maybe just a small place. <laughs> absolutely, absolutely. What else caught your eye, uh, Jerry, on on Twitter this week? There was a nice uh, long article in the Atlantic magazine about Jeff Bezos, which I really enjoyed. A uh, lot, lot of stuff in there. But I was able to find something I thought was, I uh, don't even remember who said this, but... Uh, Maybe the author of the article, but it sort of fits in what we're just talking about. He says, markets spontaneously and efficiently aggregate the knowledge of a society. A price set by markets reflects the discrete bits of knowledge of everyone. Yeah, that's what we kind of bank on. Fundamentals are baked in the price. Uh, secret fundamentals are baked in the price. Fundamentals that only a few people might know, whether it's a government uh, who's about to attack another country or a secret stuff that people try to not let uh, let out and then somebody starts buying or selling and you're like, whoa, what's going on here? I don't hear any news. I don't know that anything's happening. Uh, upside, downside, breakout, let's go with it. And that will occur sometimes as well. We've heard it this weekend, right? It's a uh, question I think was, is there, are we using volume, open interest or any other non-price based you know, signals or indicator or data to determine whether we want to be in a trend or not. And we all said, no, price is the most important. All the information that we need is baked into the price. It's it's in there, and that is the cleanest thing that you can work with. So it's price only. Yeah, I mean, and, 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 and nowadays, of course, investors will hail the strong, massive performance that uh, the uh, Amazon stock has produced. But... Let's not forget that it had a 94% drawdown on the way. And, and it kind of ties into what we talked bef about before, um, that uh, in order to get these outsized returns, you, you need to uh, accept and allow for uh, some painful periods as well. Um, and, um, and if we should put it into trend-following context, I guess I remember when of course, this is not a, an amusing event, but when he did get divorced recently, someone put out a chart showing the 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 the, the, the ride, the trend of of the uh, of the Amazon stock, and and then of course they were claiming that his wife would be the best trend follower in the world because she was getting out of the high. So uh, you know, price only, yeah. And sometimes uh, to get small returns, like eight percent, you have to take a huge risk. <clears throat> I just don't think people appreciate that. They're 
there's nothing more risky than just holding on to something is it's and never getting out. I'm just going to hold on forever. That's what it sort of takes to get those stock returns. And most of us are saying, whoa, whoa, I don't like that. <clears throat> I'd like to do a little bit more than nothing. And if I still only make 8%, that's fine. But we got to get that max drawdown more in line with the risk we're taking. So if when you go multiple years and it keeps going up, ah, there is no risk. The risk has not been there. So we keep fighting that same battle and same argument. But, uh, you know, in the long run, people know in their gut that uh, losing half your money is probably something you want to avoid. Yeah, and, 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 and go, going back to your point earlier, Jerry, I mean, you know, what, what happens even when you start combining some of these things? I mean, the, the risk-reward is, is even greater, right? I mean, we're not arguing necessarily, even though it would be lovely if everyone just did trend-following. Um, we probably would have too much money in, in trend-following anyways. But, you know, the benefit of, of, of these things, which is just not a new concept, it was written about in 1983 by Dr. Lindner, and, and you know, that argument still stands, let alone, or, or and but yet it's still so hard for people to kind of fully accept uh, that 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 is the case so yeah um few more tweets before we take some of the questions we had this week yeah let's do one more that i sort of tweeted uh, in response to a friend who was talking about uh of all things um cockroaches mm -hmm. and my friend says don't Let's forget that Mother Nature is a very severe parent, and 99% of all species ever evolved are now extinct, which is why some say it's best to emulate the long-surviving cockroach and trading system design. Simple, robust, durable. And many years ago, I read this book, uh, and I tweeted uh, <clears throat> this particular gentleman's uh, the author of A Demon of Our Own Design, and I think it, the guy's right um, about the cockroach. And he said... Uh, Cockroach behavior is coarse. It is limited. It misses lots of things. It is not optimized for a particular time or location. It is a simple, foolproof creature. And while it never dominates any ecosystem it exists in, its behavior allows it to prosper in almost any environment. As such, it has been moderately successful over an extremely long time. And so I think that's a good motto is uh, just... Good enough. You know, we said good enough a few times. And then just be moderately successful, but with an emphasis on surviving and existing over long periods of time. It's a great quote, actually. Yeah, and I like it. Yeah, maybe we need to substitute the CE and CTA with cockroach rather than... <laughs> <laughs> yeah. But it's true, isn't it? I mean, it's just true. It's just, just how it works, right? You know, we grind our way through... Uh, through uh, all sorts of challenges and environments. And, and actually, I mean, of course, this is just another way to go back to David Drews's, uh, uh, you know, comment about some of the most robust strategies, in his opinion, are the ones that, that are most volatile, right? Because they're not optimized for any particular environment. Um, so true. And you said uh, during the weekend that uh, a good, robust trend following program has a certain profile. Mm -hmm. uh, the ups and downs and the long periods of underperformance. So if you see something like that looks too good, maybe it's optimized for a certain special period. So, yeah, really. And evidently the cockroach, if you read the book, or I'm sure I got it from the book. I didn't do an exhaustive study of cockroaches. I can guarantee you that. But it has some sort of uh, ability to just uh, overreact to... Uh, what it perceives as danger and immediately like scatter and run away. Mm -hmm. And I'm like, yeah, I'm always overreacting to a retracement and a loss in my, on all of my trades. And I get out and just scatter away and maybe have to buy it at the highs again. It wasn't an error. I wasn't wrong. Quote unquote. Uh, I was just, uh, being overly cautious that bad things can happen. And I think that's, one of the reasons we survive, of course, you know, the, the rule takes small losses. The most important one. Yeah. 
Well, now we have cockroaches and we still have the turtles, of course. So uh, we're moving into the animal kingdom of trading strategies, I think. There's another story about hedgehogs. I'll, I'll research that. So, yeah, we got to keep collecting our animals. <laughs> yes, yes, absolutely. Any more tweets now or do you want to take a couple of questions? Um, Let's do some questions. Okay, cool, cool. So here we have a question from uh, Scott. Uh, appreciate you uh, sending in the question. And by the way, I think maybe we haven't said it recently. I'm sure most of you already know that if you want us to um, answer one of your questions or several for that matter, uh, just email uh, info at toptradersonplug.com and, and we do our best to to deal with the questions uh, the, the same or the following uh, week. Uh, so... Um, Anyways, um, let's say, uh, let's see here, um, two main questions. Um, do the podcast members prefer a certain type of moving average, i.e. simple versus exponential? And how is closing price determined? Do you use settlement or the last price, i.e. the close? Moritz? Good question. Yeah. So I'm using settlement. Um, most of the time, in in my experience, the last price that a data data vendor reports to you is also the settlement, even though the market may continue to trade after the settlement on that day. So, for instance, take the S&P E-mini contract. Um, the settlement of that contract is, um, uh, in European time, it's 14 minutes and 13 seconds past 10 p.m., which is, what is that? That is... Uh, that is um, 6 p.m. and 40 minutes and 30 seconds Eastern time. Um, and uh, no, what I'm uh, saying. Four, 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 four exactly. Four, 14 and 30 seconds. And then it, it settles during a 30 second period VVOP and the settlement price is determined. But obviously the contract continues to trade. So it will have then thereafter different prices. But what the data vendor reports back to you as a last price tends to be the settlement price. At least this is my setting. And that is what I'm using for my system. So I'm using the settlement price. Um, for all of the markets and as far as the moving average is concerned that was the other question exponential or simple I don't have a preference for that to be honest I'm not using it and I don't think that it would make that much of a difference whether you used a say 50 over 200 day simple moving average crossover or whether you made that with uh, you know exponential it may get you in to the trade at a slightly different point in time but I don't think over the long run that is all too different uh, to other methods. Any thoughts, any views, uh, Jerry, on that? Yeah, I don't I think uh, none of the prices are special. I don't have any special um, indication of what's going to be happening. So I think it's, uh, it's most it's with most things, uh, make a reasonable choice and stick with it and be, be consistent with what you chose to do. I'm uh, kind of anti um, exponential or once again thinking that uh, oh maybe recent data is more valuable than other data so just for just for the heck of it i would not do that i would just always use uh, equal weighting all the prices and simple moving average yeah no um yeah agree with uh, what you've said here i mean consistency is the most important thing uh scott just uh, you know choose one but keep doing it in terms of the moving averages um I would just test and whatever you feel uh, is appropriate for you. Uh, just just pick that one. I don't think, as, as Morris and Jerry said, it, it's not going to make a huge uh, different one way or the other, I think. Um, but like uh, Jerry, uh, sorry, Morris, at least uh, what he said, we we don't really use moving averages either. So, um, so I don't have a strong opinion about it. All right, so here's a question, um, probably uh, mostly for you guys. Um, question for the group, please. Oh, sorry, I should start by saying this is from Carl. Um, hi, Carl. Thanks very much for your question here. Uh, question for the group. When you mention ATR in respect to initial stop and trading stops, is it from the close? Question um, mark. Yes, so um, again... Moritz, do you what do you uh, what do you do when you use ATR? Yeah, so close here, you know, for for those that trade the futures contract, it is the settlement. Um, that is the 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 real definition of you know the close. I mean, we can say close, but it's actually settlement price. But um, so what I do is um, 
I take it from the fill. So for instance, for my initial stop, which is a certain offset with ATR, but I'm not using that from the settlement price. I'm using that from my fill, mm -hmm. which may be slightly different than a settlement price. Yeah, which makes sense. Any any thoughts on that, Jerry? I mean, I've uh, done it two ways. Uh, from the entry price or from the theoretical entry price, if you want to kind of treat the system without regard to actually what's happening in real life. But uh, I can see both. It's probably not a big deal. Once again, just pick one way and do it that way all the time. Yeah. Yeah. All right. Final question. Um, a little bit of a different uh, one, I would say, uh, from Nathan. Um, and let's see if we can somehow uh, visualize that. Um, kind of ties in with what we talked earlier about the trend barometer, but uh, here we go. Um, how would you explain and or show that we have been in low volatility environment versus the long-term history, say 50 or to 75 years? I attempted to show this via the daily ATR compression in the euro dollar over the last five years to my two brothers, um, but I don't think they bought my explanation or usage of ATR. Curious how you might actually uh, articulate, sorry, articulate it to people outside of trading. So um, I wonder whether you've also come across this um, problem or challenge that that sometimes we say that there's not maybe been enough big trends in certain periods of time, could be the last five years, could be any period. And then how do we how do we go about kind of um, visualizing this? I think you can do it in a qualitative way, looking at the charts, kind of like eyeballing it. You should see that there haven't been that many trends. I mean, there have been a few markets like the you know fixed income markets that we've mentioned where there have been massive trends. But using you know using your eye, you will probably be able to see that also those moves in the past couple of years have been less volatile than in years prior. That's a qualitative a qualitative assessment. Um, if you don't like the ATR, you can calculate the historical volatility of the market. You know, just take daily returns, calculate the standard deviation of those returns. If you want, you can annualize that to come up with a annualized volatility number, and then have like a rolling, say, a rolling 100-day or rolling 200-day realized volatility of a certain market, and then of a group of markets, and you'll see that you know that rolling volatility has been decreasing during the past couple of years, um, ever essentially pretty pretty much ever since the global financial crisis has stopped. Do you have anything you use? I guess I go through the charts and look and see what's happening and has happened. And I'm, my strategy is uh, going to struggle if we don't have trends that last a year or two. And uh, <clears throat> so I, if I see one, if I don't see a lot of those, you know, we haven't had what I need. And then... If I do see some, I'll say, okay, how did I handle that? Did I keep getting chopped around and it became two or three trades over a two-year period? Or was it one big trade over a two-year period? And how did I handle the exit? So uh, there's a lot of different ways of looking at it, uh, market failure or system failure. Uh, and I guess to some degree, if you start with the premise that, uh, well, the trends, there's enough trends to pay for the small losses, I guess that's your fault, uh, and that's your conclusion, and maybe you can't blame it on history. You have to own it. So I think that's – we we believe and we've experienced uh, positive performance over many, many years, but most most people haven't, and they don't really care or know it like we do. So you have to know what's going on and be able to defend on many different fronts. Yeah, I mean, I agree. Uh, I mean, price range compression is certainly something that you could somehow uh, measure if you wanted to, too. But I, but I also want to caution, like Jerry, about you know, uh, if if this study, and I don't know if that's what you're trying to use it for, uh, Nathan, to kind of um, you know confirm or explain why maybe performance uh, in from a trend following perspective hasn't been as strong as it used to be, but. But I, I, you know, we on our side, we don't really see that. We have no evidence that it's not, uh, you know, uh, as as good as it's always been. It's 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 it 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 
changes over time and and so we've had some tough years we've had some great years uh, i mean 2014 is not that far away that was a great year 2017 was a great year 2019 so far is a pretty good year so i mean um what what i will say and i think that maybe i don't know if we talked about this uh, today but um when when people generally talk about the industry not doing as well as it used to be i think we have to be careful with that and concluding that that means trend following doesn't work or work less is less effective because there are two things that plays a role one the risk free rate of return has gone to zero and that affects track records there's nothing we can do about that it's that's just the way it is but the other thing is i think a lot of managers as they grow choose to become le- less volatile and when what well, students you start lowering your volatility you will lower your returns so um for the most for the most part unless you really do increase your risk adjust return that's another uh, possibility of course but generally speaking and and this is the vicious circle i find we have because in the last 20 years there's been an, an, an enormous increase uh, at least relatively speaking in terms of the investor uh, you know, institutional investor participation in, 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 in what we do in our industry. It's completely changed from what it was 25 years ago where it was dominated by high net worth individuals. And nowadays, it's, it's these big allocations. And these allocations, they look for manager that looks safe because they it's done by committee and they don't want to find suddenly uh, to having to defend a line item in their portfolio that is down 35%, etc., etc. et, cetera, et cetera. And so... Uh, so I think that the circle is that the investors out there prefer um, low of all strategies within our space. And so the managers tend to adapt to fill that need. And that's why performance also, uh, when you look at the indices, which are, of course, driven by the larger managers, uh, that they look like they're making less money today than they used to do. But I think that, that those two functions play a role um, so it may not be the actual underlying trend models that are, you know, perhaps have, that have changed for the worse. Um, I actually think we all as an industry are getting smarter all the time. I think we find better ways, but I think we have to balance size um, for for return. Um, so so some chooses to um, to to grow much larger, and and in order to do so, they. Um, they 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 reduce their their uh, expected return, so to speak. Um, so those are my thoughts. Yeah, the whole idea of like put me in your portfolio, hide me in your portfolio. I'll have more volatility, but you know, uh, you're only interested in the the uh, the result of the whole portfolio. Sometimes I do well, sometimes I underperform, but uh, that's no that's no good for so many people. No. The other problem, of course, is that what we uh, find is that. CTAs get such a small allocation in the portfolios uh, anyways to begin with. And then then at the same time, they want us to be less volatile. So we have no chance really to make a meaningful impact uh, in in a portfolio return, Um, uh, really. uh, I mean, how can you you have an impact on a portfolio that's 60% equities if you're only allocating 2% to trend followers? Uh, So... I mean, to trend followers with five to ten percent vol. Right. I mean, so 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 you know, people, you know, this may change over time, and maybe we maybe we do need, frankly, a big crisis to remind people about this. Um, maybe, maybe that's the only way people will realize, uh, as Jerry mentioned, that they are stuck in 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 strategies that have, um, you know, lowish. Uh, returns but still massive downside potential um and and maybe you need to to, to reconsider your, your over asset allocation um who knows who knows yeah, well there's one solution and that would be uh take the private equity route and just don't report performance for a year or two and <laughs> exactly uh, there's no volatility uh we just whenever we have a good uh period month we'll report march 15th 2020 uh you're up 12% for the past 12 year, twelve months. So uh, it's silly, but oh, clients love that private equity, and that's part of it, not knowing. So uh, it's kind of silly, but uh, yeah, I agree with all that. Good stuff. Those were the questions uh, this week. 
Um, and as I mentioned, we love to uh, to deal with some of these. And I think actually, from speaking to many of our listeners uh, over the years, we uh, we certainly are told that um, listeners um, like this part of the podcast because it's dealing with questions and concerns and struggles uh, that are real, that are that is out there. It's not really all only about what we think uh, might be useful. It's all about what uh, you as the listener feel is is useful for you. So let me run through um, performance uh, of last week. And um, since uh, we have some time, if there are any other topics you want to bring up, um, by all means, uh, let's do that. But interestingly enough, from from Thursday to Thursday, so these numbers are always based on on Thursday evening, actually almost nothing changed uh, performance-wise in the CTA world. Um, so uh, the beta 50 is down still about 2% for the month, uh, still up just shy of 7% for the year. SOCGEN CTA index down 2.2 for the month, uh, up 62 for the year. Uh, SOCGEN trend index down 3.78, uh, up 9.35 for the year. Uh, SOCGEN short-term traders index um, down 0.06, uh, so flat really for the month, up 1.76 for the year. And the British Alternatives Index down 3.31, up 8.24, uh, completely unchanged for that one uh, since last week. So so not a great deal going on, um, it would seem, on that, even though when you look at the news flow, it seems like it's been pretty busy. Um, so what else do you want to, if anything, do you want to bring up um, before we... We bring this week's delayed, by the way, apologize um, for our delay, but I'm sure you understand that we have uh, been busy doing other things this weekend. So uh, so we are doing it on a Monday morning for the first time. So we'll be back to normal programming uh, next week. I hope we have uh, the opportunity to do a deep dive uh, on this past weekend and hear back uh, pros and cons from uh, the attendees and uh, think about what we learned from them and how we can uh, do more and, what, and how it's going to be different and better the next time. So bigger, better, and different. And uh, so I think we had a good weekend and it's probably something we should uh, consider doing. And it's, I think it served a good purpose. Yeah, any feedback will be highly welcome and appreciated. I just want to you know, thank everyone again. I had a great time. I hope everybody else had a great time too. I enjoyed it. Thanks for coming to New York, um, hanging out with us, becoming friends, talking trend following for a weekend. Thanks for the lunches and the dinners and the great time. Um, hope we can do it again. Yeah, and let's not forget. I mean, we had someone traveling all the way from Australia. That's pretty yes. much as far as you can get from uh, New York, and that that just great shows efforts. great effort. Shows the commitment uh, in the group and the focus. And uh, I, as I said, uh, I think earlier on, I, I would not be surprised if we, if uh, in a few years we uh, we we hear a lot more about some of the people who attended. Uh, so uh, good on them. Um, yeah, I mean, happy to uh, wrap it up today. Uh, for for now, if if you if there's nothing else you want to bring up, um, we can do that. And of course, we will we will be back um, next weekend. Next weekend, usual programming time. Um, if you want to, um, you know, help us continue to grow the podcast, uh, you know, it would be helpful if you share this episode with uh, a like-minded friend yeah you know one is enough um but it certainly helps us spread the uh, the good word um but other than that from the big apple from jerry moritz and me thanks so much for spending part of your day with us uh, we're grateful for your support and uh, we can't wait to be back with you next week Thanks for listening to the Systematic Investor Podcast Series. If you enjoy this series, go on over to iTunes and leave an honest rating and review. And be sure to listen to all the other episodes from Top Traders Unplugged. If you have questions about systematic investing, send us an email with the word question in the subject line to info at toptradersunplugged.com and we'll try to get it on the show. 
And remember, all the discussion that we have about investment performance is about the past, and past performance does not guarantee or even infer anything about future performance. Also understand that there's a significant risk of financial loss with all investment strategies, and you need to request and understand the specific risks from the investment manager about their products before you make investment decisions. Thanks for spending some of your valuable time with us, and we'll see you on the next episode of the Systematic Invest.